Hey everybody, welcome back to the Financial Freedom Show. My name is Rob Berger. In this episode, we're gonna take a deep dive into ARK Innovations. That's an ETF, it's an actively managed ETF. Its ticker symbol is ARKK. If you're new to the channel, uh, I do a lot of um, analysis of folks' portfolios. They leave comments below the videos with the ticker symbols uh, uh, that they've invested in and what percentage they have in each. And I've got dozens now that I need to get to, but I evaluate these and other portfolios. And one thing I've noticed is that a lot of the portfolios fake folks are leaving me in the comments have ARK ETFs in them. And ARK Innovation, A-R-K-K, is uh, the most prevalent one that I, that I see. And so I wanna spend a few minutes in this video uh, covering three things about ARK. The first is why I have not and will not and never will invest in ARK Innovations. Uh, the second thing I want to look at is why I could be making a terrible, terrible mistake. I don't think so, but but I could be. And that's kind of important. You know, we, we shouldn't, as best as we can, we should keep our ego. Not always easy for me, maybe not easy for you, but we should keep our ego out of financial decisions as best we can. And so we should at least acknowledge that whatever we think is the right course could, you know, turn out to be wrong. And so why why might I be wrong? on ARK. And then the third thing we're going to look at is if you're if you're going to invest in ARK or if you have invested and you plan to stick with it, maybe some things to think about as you navigate what will no doubt be very choppy waters uh, as we move forward. All right, so let's get started. So ARK Invest is an, uh, an ETF, an actively managed ETF company. Uh, it was founded by Kathy Wood. Uh, she is uh, got a 20 year plus history in, in, in financial services. Uh, she graduated uh, summa, summa cum laude uh, from USC in 1981, obviously an incredibly smart person. And I gotta tell you, I really love her story. Uh, she was at Alliance Bernstein and she'd been there since I think 2001, if I remember correctly. Uh, and she wanted to start what is now basically ARK Innovation. She wanted to start an actively managed ETF that focused on companies that innovate. And the folks at Alliance Bernstein looked at it and they said, yeah, that's just too risky for us. Thanks, but no thanks. And she said, okay, I respect that, goodbye. And she left in 2014 and founded uh, ARK Invest. And you know, I don't know the more specific details behind it, but I'm gonna guess that that took a lot of courage. And she strikes me as someone um, who has the courage of her conviction. She has a, a very strong uh, opinions about the financial markets, about investing, and she's not afraid to go long on those on those views. And so I have to give her a lot of credit for that. And uh, so that's sort of the person behind ARK Invest and ARK Innovations. Of course, she has a whole team with her. It's not just Kathy Wood. Um, and so she started the, the fund in 2014. And let's take a quick look at it. Let me first show you Kathy Wood. There she is. This is the ARK Invest website. And uh, uh, she's uh, been a very good communicator for her firm to, to convey you know, what she believes, why she believes it, sort of what she sees as the future for uh, you know, the economy, for uh, her funds. And I think in that sense, uh, she's been quite good at, uh, at messaging uh, the sort of where she sees the market and where she sees ARK Invest. Now, uh, specifically ARK Innovation, I wanna look at it in Morningstar, and I've sort of blown this up about as big as I can get it. And we wanna kind of take a look at a couple of things. First of all, notice it is a, um, a five-star fund. I basically ignore the Morningstar star rating. Um, a word about that, it basically looks at the performance of a fund three, five, 10 years, does some averaging, looks at costs, but basically it's a backward looking rating. And, uh, you know, not to offend anyone at Morningstar, but I basically find it to be worthless. All right. So it's a five star fund. Uh, it's got an expense ratio of 75 basis points, certainly high if you compare it to an index fund, but I would say it's, I would call that reasonable for an actively managed fund. They have 21 a billion dollars in assets under management, so a fairly large fund, and it's um, trailing 12-month yield 1.83. So that kind of gives you, at a high level, uh, some statistics about the fund, but let's sort of dive into its performance 
Then we'll go to the portfolio and that'll explain why I'm not investing in it. So if we go to performance, uh, we can see, and it's compared to an index, I think in this case, it's probably a mid cap index that, that Morningstar is using. And I'll, we'll, we'll look at that a little bit more in, in just a bit. But you'll notice that from when it, it started, you know, it was pretty much neck and neck with the index. This was, you can see here, the end of 2014. And then in 2017 is when it really sort of started to separate from the index. And then it was last year, of course, that it had its breakout year. In fact, we can look at some of the details. We can see here, here's last year, 150% gain. That's not bad. Uh, obviously crushed. Um, uh, the index, a uh, phenomenal year. Uh, 2017, another huge uh, year. And it were those two years where in the category uh, that Morningstar places this fund, uh, ARK Invest was number one. Number one in 2017, number one in 2020. It did trail the index in 2016. Um, you can see here, well, right here. Um, and it was basically, you know, even with the index in, in 2019. This year, it's fallen behind. And that's sort of been the big news as the performance of ARK Invest has fallen off. I can assure you though that Kathy Wood is as bullish on her fund today as she ever has been. We'll talk in a minute about why she is. Uh, but that's the performance. Now, what I wanna do is show you the same performance in Stock Rover. This is another tool that I use to evaluate stocks and ETFs and portfolios. And I've got it here, ARK and S&P 500. And you can see now, you know, it was, in line with the S&P 500 for the first year or so, or maybe two years, it started to break out uh, over the next few years. And then uh, sort of after the COVID crash, uh, the rebound for ARC obviously uh, significantly higher than the S&P 500. But at the same time, since it's, it's, it's high around $155, it's fallen pretty significantly. At one point it was almost under 100, but I don't think it actually went below 100, but it's bumped up a little bit, but obviously it's fallen off its highs. One thing I wanna show you here, and you'll see why I'm gonna compare it to this company in a minute, but let's compare it to Tesla. And what you'll notice, so Tesla's in green, and you'll notice that it kind of bumped along the S&P 500 and even ARC uh, innovation for a long time. They all dipped, right? And then like a, like a cannonball out of a cannon, Tesla just shot through the, I guess, shot to the moon, right? Just like Dogecoin. Uh, and, and just look at the gains there, 1,800%. I mean, it's just insane. And you'll notice that while ARK didn't keep pace with Tesla, it certainly was moving in the same direction up and now in the same direction down. And this really now gets to uh, why I'm not a big fan of ARC Innovation, notwithstanding its incredible returns last year. And it's because the companies that it invests in are, quite honestly, not making any money. Many of them are losing money. And um, I just don't think that's a good approach to investing. And as you might expect, Tesla is a big part of ARC Innovation's portfolio. We're gonna look at the portfolio, but I have a question for you guys that um, and gals that are either invested in ARK Innovation or are thinking about it. Here's the question. Can you name, uh, we'll just say five of its top 10 holdings? If you can't, you need to do your homework, right? If you can't name at least five of its top 10 holdings, then in my humble opinion, it's not investing. You, you're, you're probably in it simply because of its remarkable performance last year. And I think that's a recipe for disaster. Now, some of you might be able to just name off the top 10, and that's terrific if you've done your homework. What you really need to do with an actively managed either ETF or mutual fund, with an index fund, you really just need to know how much it costs and what index it tracks, and that's it. Uh, but with actively managed funds, you need to do your homework. So with that, let's take a look at the portfolio. We're back in Morningstar. And we're at the portfolio tab, as you see here, and we can get some a high level view first. We can see that it's very much a growth fund. In fact, it's off the charts. It's outside of the tic-tac-toe board, as I like to call it, right? This is the Morningstar style box. It's way out here. And we see that in, for example, down here, the price to earnings. This is of the fund. It's almost 96, 95.96 is the PE. And what that means is, 
Uh, for every dollar in earnings that one of the companies that's, that's owned by ARK Invest, uh, for every dollar in earnings, you pay 96 bucks for that one dollar of earnings. Another way to think about it is, in order for you to recoup your investment, not in the form of dividends, but just in, in the form of the earnings uh, that these companies generate, and we'll look at, we're going to look at the top 10 in a minute, it's going to take you 96 years. That's, uh, that's older than I am. That's a long time. All right. So this is very much a growth fund. And if we go all the way down, there's a lot of data here. We're going to skip most of it. You can look at some of it if it's of interest to you. This is what we want to look at. These are the top 10 holdings. We can see that there are 53 equity holdings. We see that right here. We see that there's an 80% reported turnover. I'll we'll talk about that in a minute. And then here are the top 10 holdings. And you can see Tesla, which is why I compared it over here, is a full 10 plus percent of the portfolio. Investing in ARC Innovation is taking, is making a big bet. Uh, it's 10% uh, on Tesla. We'll talk about that in a minute. Let me first talk about this 80% turnover and what that means. Uh, what that means is that 80% uh, of the value of the fund gets bought and sold uh, in the course of a year. Uh, that's quite high. If we go to, let's look at, um, we'll look at AVU, which is the Vanguard S&P 500. Uh, now this is just an index fund, right? If we go to the portfolio, it should show us the turnover. Yeah, 4%, right? So what that means as a practical matter, two things. It means that the trading costs, which are not part of the expense ratio, uh, they come out separately. Uh, will be high because they're doing a lot of buying and selling. That's the first thing. Now, the fund is huge, so maybe that's not a huge, uh, significant concern, but you should be aware of it. But the second thing means is you could be paying a lot of taxes on this fund because that buying and selling, I'm sure they do what they can to manage the tax liabilities, but it's going to generate a lot of uh, capital gains. And in fact, I did some digging, and this is from uh, 2020, and you can see this is from ARK Invest. You can see the fund we're looking at today is this one right here. And you can see that it paid, uh, the NAV was about 130. It paid a, a buck 60, almost a buck 63 in short term capital gains, another 41, 42 cents in long term capital gains for a total of over $2. So, uh, and you can see the approximate distribution percentage is uh, just under uh, 100, uh, 160 basis points. So, what that means is, if you're going to own this fund, and we'll talk about this more at the end, it's best to hold it in a retirement account. This could generate some taxes for you. And, and by the way, these taxes get generated even if you don't sell the fund, right? So you got to keep that in mind. Even if you, you buy and hold, you'll, you'll be paying taxes on these distributions uh, each and every year. Of course, the actual amount will vary from year to year, but at an 80% turnover rate, you're going to be paying some serious taxes. All right. So let's take a look at these companies, and I've gone through and looked at them all. They basically either lose money or make very little relative to their earnings. And I'll start at the bottom, actually. Let's look at Zillow. So how I would do this is go back to a Morningstar. We can just type in Zillow. There it is. I guess I should have guessed that its ticker is Z, right? And um, now, now we're looking at this individual stock, and so the data that Morningstar gives us is a little different, actually significantly different than if we're looking at, say, an ETF uh, or a, a mutual fund. But I want to go to financials. Let's see how Zillow's doing. We all know Zillow, right? That's the website we use to look up how much our neighbor paid for their home or our brother-in-law, right? Uh, all right. So if we go to financials, there we are. Well, we can see the net income. We know it's negative because the red there and it's below the line. But we can actually um, see what we can do. Go to a detailed view. Maybe. And morning starts being slow. Well, we know it's losing money. Well, let me try that one more time. Oh, here we go. So net income, lost money 18, 19, 20. On a trailing 12 month, it may be scratching out a little bit of a profit. I guess we'll see uh, what the future holds. Spotify. We can do the same thing. I'm not going to do all of them, but I'll just do one more. There's Spotify. We can go to financials. Yeah, it's losing money as well. 
and its losses are actually growing. Now, not every company here is losing money. Some of these are, are making some. I think Roku might be making a little bit. Um, of course, Tesla makes a little bit. It doesn't make very much selling cars, uh, oddly enough, but it does make a little bit of money. But the, the point is, when you look at the top 10 companies that, uh, that ARK Invest owns, as a whole, they're not making any money. And that's a, <laughs> that's, that's a real, real problem. And now that raises, I think, an important question. You say, okay, Rob, I get that. They're not making any money. Fair enough. Um, but if that's the case, then why was it up 150% in 2020? I mean, wh why did it do so well? You're obviously not telling us the whole story. And that is a great question. We need to understand why it went up. And for that matter, we could ask the question, why did Dogecoin go through the roof? Why did, did people have all of this money to send GameStop through the roof? Why did the S&P 500 didn't go up 150%, but after the COVID crash, it went up significantly? Why did that happen? And uh, we really need to think hard about that question. I think it's a couple of reasons. Interest rates are still at rock bottom, historically um, uh, the lowest, certainly, uh, that I think anyone has seen in, in our lifetimes. Uh, and they're incredibly low, and the government has been pumping money uh, into the economy. They've been doing it in a couple of ways. The Fed has been buying bonds. So they buy bonds from big banks, and they give the banks cash, <laughs> and that cash goes out into the economy. If they want to reverse that, and they eventually will, they'll sell bonds to those banks to soak up that cash. But right now, they're buying bonds, sending cash into the system, and even beyond that, the government's saying, wait a minute, we're just going to start passing out money. Uh, perhaps for good reasons, don't want to get into the politics of it, but between stimulus checks and unemployment benefits and small business loans, the government has been pouring cash uh, into the economy. And I believe that really accounts for a large part of the increase in everything from the companies that ARK Invest owns to the companies in the S&P 500 uh, to the price of, of Bitcoin. And in fact, what we saw this year, when interest rates started to tick up, and they did, the 10-year went from just over 100 basis points to, at one point, it was over 170 basis points. It settled down. I think it's around 160 basis points now. But when we saw that, and there was some, just even a little bit of concern on, for inflation, what happened? Well, Bitcoin crashed, right? It basically got cut in half. Um, and many of the companies that ARK Invest owns uh, went down significantly. And that explains why ARK Invest is not doing as well uh, this year. And so we have to understand, I think, why it did well to understand why it might not do well in the future or what are the circumstances uh, that could cause ARK Innovation uh, to run into some problems. I think eventually it's going to run into significant problems and see significant losses. The problem is, I don't know when. Yes, it's down so far this year in 2021, but it could be up by the end of the year. We don't, I don't know what the economy is going to do. I know folks are scared, worried about inflation, but maybe there won't be inflation and maybe interest rates uh, won't go up and perhaps ARC will end up having a great 2021. But I personally believe that you cannot invest in companies at this level that aren't making money and do well in the long term. It may be that a couple of the companies that ARK Invest owns will be home runs. I think many of them uh, will not be. The problem is I think it's almost impossible to predict which one will be the winners and which ones won't. And when you're paying 95 or $96 for $1 in earnings, I think that is a recipe for disaster. And that's why I don't invest in ARK Innovation and why I will not. Now, I mentioned I could be wrong. So, uh, what does Kathy Wood say about all this? How does she think about this? So first of all, does she agree? Does she agree that if uh, interest rates went up and inflation went up, that it would hurt her fund? And I can assure you, she absolutely does agree with that. What she believes is that deflation is actually a greater risk uh, than inflation. And she actually breaks it down. And she looks at three types of deflation. So the first one is good deflation. She says, look, Innovation drives down prices. We see that, for example, in the cost of batteries. Remember, she's a big uh, believer in Tesla. More than 10% of ARC innovation is in Tesla. And uh, of course, batteries, really important to Tesla. And by the way, I love Tesla. I've ordered a Tesla. I'm still waiting on it. 
Elon, maybe a little help here. Great company. Not sure it's a great investment. Great company. Obviously, the cost of batteries matter. And she sees the cost of batteries declining due to innovation. Uh, in fact, she says, and I'm quoting, for every cumulative doubling of capacity in battery packs for electric vehicles, costs drop 28%. She sees the same thing in the cost of DNA sequencing, which she says will lower healthcare costs. So she sees innovation as driving down prices, triggering deflation, and because it's brought about by innovation, she sees it as a good thing. That's the first thing. She does also see some bad deflation, which she sees as being caused by what she calls creative destruction. Here's what she says. She says roughly 50% of the S&P 500 is at risk by this creative destruction. Those companies spent the last 20 years catering to short-term investors who wanted their profits, and they wanted them now. Companies that were leveraging up to buy back shares and not investing enough in innovation. She sees this as a real problem. She sees the companies that are willing to spend money on innovation to do things like produce Teslas and um, sequence DNA uh, will be the big winners at the end of the day. And those companies, uh, that weren't innovating, weren't reinvesting back into the company, just buying back shares and even doing so with leverage, in other words, borrowing money to buy back share, shares, are going to be hurt in the long term. In fact, she talks about the electric vehicle. And she says, you know, back in 2014, folks said it was a decade away. Uh, obviously, it turned out not to be a decade away. And she didn't believe it was a decade away. In fact, she says, now we see auto manufacturers are scrambling. And I would even say scrambling for dear life. So that's the second thing. We've got good deflation through innovation. We've got bad deflation through creative destruction. And then the third, third thing she says is commodity prices uh, will come down. She believes commodity prices are overbought, uh, that people are, are sort of uh, stockpiling, if you will. But eventually, uh, that's going to work its way through the supply chain and commodity prices will come down. So she sees deflation as a, a gr more likely than inflation. As a result, interest rates will stay low. And in her world, that would be a great thing because when those things happen, as we've seen, growth companies outperform uh, value companies. Now, what would my response to that be? I have several concerns with her views, all right? And I should, I should add, she recognizes that if she's wrong, she's in trouble. She said, if we are wrong, then we will be perhaps uniquely wrong. I'm not sure what, exactly what that means, but it doesn't sound like a good thing. That's not what she wants to be. I don't think she wants to be wrong. She doesn't want to be uniquely wrong. Here are my concerns for her. The first is, with regard to good deflation through innovation, the problem I see is that innovation, while it lowers costs of components, it actually doesn't lower uh, the cost of what consumers are spending. I'll give you an example. You can buy a 40-inch TV today for a lot less than you could have five or 10 years ago, right? Uh, perhaps that's a uh, good deflation through innovation, except that who buys a 40 inch TV anymore? We don't, we want bigger and better. We want a, a 50 inch, we want a 60 inch, we want an 80 inch. It's just gonna keep going. We don't, we're not satisfied with yesterday's technology. Yes, we could build yesterday's technology for less today than we could a year ago, but no one's building yesterday's technology. We're building bigger and bigger TVs. The same thing with batteries. What's gonna happen when the cost of batteries go down? We're gonna demand not just 300 miles on a single charge, but 400, but 500, but 600. We're gonna keep wanting more and more and more. We're not really good at defining enough. <laughs> and uh, it's an example, the iPhone. The original iPhone, I remember when it came out, man, I was excited about that iPhone. 2007, guess what it cost, you remember? between 500 and 600 bucks. What's the iPhones today cost? Between 1,000 and 1,400. You can get older models for less, not $500. You can get older models for less. The new model, $1,000 and the max, because we just need bigger, we need bigger screens. And as I get older, I kind of appreciate that. But in any event, 1,400 bucks. It's a perfect example of yes, we're innovating. Yes, individual costs of components and technology go down, but we're now assembling them in ways where consumers are spending more and more. We want bigger, we want faster, and I guess we want, I don't know, prettier if today's iPhone is prettier than 2007's. All right, so I'm not really a big believer in this idea that innovation will actually cause deflation, right? Um, the other thing I would add is, 
Innovation and tech and AI and all of these great things are only one part of the cost structure. There's a lot of costs that you really can't innovate out of the system. So even in its best circumstances, I don't think innovation itself is going to cause some massive deflation across our entire economy. Just not buying it. And as for the bad deflation, yes, there are always companies that are behind, but I just don't buy the story that companies are now strapped for cash because they bought back shares. The first thing is, when you look at total buybacks, say, of the S&P 500, it's dominated by the large cap companies. You know, you take the top 10 companies out, and the buyback numbers look very, very different. Apple is buying back a truckload of shares measured by dollars, but they're not strapped for cash. They have more cash than they know what to do with. So does uh, Google, for example. I mean, you know, the American companies are flooded with cash. Berkshire Hathaway, buying back shares, but flooded with cash. And in fact, to the point where I think Warren Buffett would acknowledge it's kind of a problem. What are we gonna do with all this cash we have? So I just don't buy the story that companies have levered up, they've taken on all this cash and just sh shoveled it right out the door into share buybacks, and therefore, they're not investing in innovation. Now, I will say on the commodities front, I don't really have an opinion. I have no clue what the price of commodities will do by the end of today, let alone by the end of the year. Kathy Wood could be absolutely right. I have no idea. But what I, I do know is that uh, I'm not a big believer in her view of price movements. Certainly, we could have deflation. Certainly, prices could stay flat for a long period of time. Uh, I don't really have even a strong opinion on that, what I do know is I don't want to put my investment portfolio in the position of having to bank on deflation in order to keep my investments from crashing, which is effectively what I believe ARK Innovation will do if we see inflation and rising interest rates. Now, if you've stayed with me this long, thank you. Uh, I want to give you uh, just uh, five quick things if you're going to invest in ARK Innovation or you are already. One, Keep it to a small percentage of your portfolio. I don't have a number to give you. I would get very nervous in anything over 10%, probably keep it to 5%. Perhaps it's a bet on growth, uh, but I, I wouldn't make a big bet. Two, I would keep it in a retirement account. As I mentioned, it's not a tax-friendly ETF. Three, prepare for vi volatility. You need to buckle up. It ain't going to be an easy ride uh, no matter what happens, even if it ends up being a big winner after 10 or 20 years which is how I evaluate an investment portfolio, not after three or four, uh, but there's gonna be a lot of, of volatility. The fourth thing is, and to me this is perhaps the biggest stumbling block is, you have to understand when you might exit the investment. When would you do that? You know, if it goes down by 50%, well that gets us back to volatility. You really wanna be able to live through the volatility. And uh, it gets me to sort of the final thing, and it has to do with a guy by the name of Bill Miller. Let me show you Bill. Um, here we go. There he is. He's not looking good that day. Uh, Bill Miller is a famed investor who ran Leg, Leg Mason Value Trust. Uh, this is actually an article uh, uh, announcing his departure from Leg Mason in 2016. And uh, if you look down here, here we go. In its heyday, the fund beat the S&P 500 every year from 1991 to 2005. That's an amazing run. And um, I actually invested in this fund. And in fact, uh, I started investing in 1993, really at the beginning of his incredible 15 year run. And the fund was recommended to me by my boss. I didn't have a lot of money, put a hundred bucks a month in, I think is what I did. And uh, after about oh, seven or eight years, long before his run ended, I came to the realization that eventually his, his run would end. I didn't know when, I didn't know what would cause it, but I, I felt that over the long term, and that's how I'm thinking and investing for decades, he would eventually underperform the S&P 500. And that's actually why I ended up leaving the fund and, and buying into index funds. Again, about 85% of our portfolio in index funds, the rest are in individual stocks. And I left that fund and it continued to have a number of good years, but eventually after 2005, it stumbled and eventually was effectively shut down um, and, you know, I think, you know, I don't hope that outcome on any fund, uh, certainly not on ARK Invest, but I think it's highly unlikely to outperform the S&P 500 uh, for even 10 years, let alone 15 years. And what I care about, even at my advanced age, is the next 40 years. So that's really the question. It's the Bill Miller question.
Uh, how confident are you going to be that it really outperforms the S&P 500? How um, willing are you to be to handle the volatility? And what are you going to do when the fund's down by 50%? Now, some would say, well, you know, Rob, maybe she's the next Warren Buffett. Yeah, they're not comparable. Or you say, what are you saying, Warren Buffett's smarter than Kathy Wood? No, I have no idea who's smarter than the other person. He's not running an ETF. He's running a publicly traded company. There's no expense ratio of 75 basis points that he needs to overcome. That's the first thing. And he can buy whole companies, which of course Berkshire Hathaway does. And when he does, he controls the capital. When earnings come in, uh, he controls what happens to those earnings, how that capital is going to get allocated. He has an advantage that uh, folks that run ETFs and mutual funds do not have. He's also a value investor, and I think value investors have the greatest chance of long-term success over growth investors. All right, so there you go. That's my take on ARK Innovation. Would love to hear your opinion. Leave them in the comments below. Please be kind. If you'd like me to take a look at your portfolio, just leave the tickers uh, in a comment along with the percentage you've invested in each. I've got a long list of them. I'm going to get back to them in the next video. So subscribe to the channel if you haven't. I will be looking at uh, another portfolio this week. Hey, until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.